this is going to be a very different presentation from Vince Cerf's. It's going to be uh, much, much more, um, I think, even easier to follow. I think that there were the little pepper signs on the, the presentation uh, guide, and I think there are no peppers on mine. So uh, so just a little bit. I think that it's more for the, uh, for the bosses than the geeks today. Um, the reason that, uh, that, that e-commerce is so important is in large part related to the data here. Every year at Forrester, we put together five-year e-commerce forecasts for probably about 20 different countries around the world. And when I aggregate it into these four large markets, as you can see, there is double-digit growth um, that is projected to continue for the next five years across every market around the world that we're measuring. And uh, the important piece is, is that for e-commerce, these numbers are exceeding physical store sales um, across the board. So what we have is that e-commerce is taking share away from, from physical transactions and uh, the consumer is choosing to, uh, to complete their transactions in, in, in the online channel. That's not surprising. Um, and we also see this across virtually every category that we measure. We see this in categories ranging from grocery delivery, which is very, very penetrated in markets like the UK and even uh, Northern Europe, to, uh, to, to consumers purchasing very, very high ticket durable goods. I think the single most expensive item um, that was ever purchased on eBay was in fact a private plane. Um, so we see this variety of every type of device actually being consumed on the internet. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a breakout of some of our, um, our own internal data from Forrester, we collect a lot of information about consumer behavior around the world and through surveys. Um, I just took an example of four of about the 30 categories that we measure. I thought that this was a good cross-section of different types of things that consumers are purchasing, um, media categories like books, apparel, consumer electronics, and food. And, uh, and these numbers are across the, the, the board and in, in different markets. We have emerging markets like China and Brazil. Um, and by the way, these are the metro uh, regional areas for, for those two markets where you see a very, very high penetration in categories like apparel or even uh, consumer electronics. And then in, uh, in the EU and the US, we're seeing uh, differences in, in, those, uh, in those categories as well. And the analogy that I like to use to, to really illustrate this is a, is a chess analogy. I have um, a young daughter that um, she's seven years old and I made her join the chess club at, at her school. And uh, one of the, the rules that, um, that, that she, she learned that I was, um, you know, kind of it reminded me of, of my own childhood was the rule in chess where the, the, the least powerful piece on the chess board is the pawn. And uh, when that pawn moves to the other side of the board, when, you know, it's, it's usually it happens, you know, several moves into the game, um, it becomes the queen, and that's called the pawn promotion. And uh, what that, that is, is that it's this transformation from the least powerful piece to the most powerful piece. And it's a big deal because essentially that creates the end game and, and uh, at that point you've won, um, or you're close to winning. And uh, I think that that's a very, very good analogy to what's happening in retail and e-commerce where the e-commerce channel about a decade ago was very, very tertiary and it was largely siloed. It was perceived as an afterthought. It really wasn't something that even received a lot of nurturing and investment. And uh, the fact that over time it has transformed into essentially the most powerful uh, channel for any given business, I think, is really the, uh, the, the, the point that I, you know, I think I want to make for the rest of this presentation. And it speaks to the importance, not just of the online retail, but also the multi-channel and this expression that we hear often of, of omni-channel. And, uh, and I think that one of the easiest ways to, to illustrate and kind of walk through the rest of this presentation is in, you know, kind of the universal, the vowels that, that we have in all of our languages. And, and I'm going to go through each of those and talk about a key point within e-commerce that I think designates and hopefully is a good mnemonic device for you to, to remember some of the key points. So I'm going to go through A-E-I-O-U for each of these. So what we're going to talk about are agile execution, everywhere access, the innovation, 
orthodoxy abandonment and unique experiences that are really what have made e-commerce as critical and important as they are. So first I want to talk about some of the agile execution. And this isn't agile from you know, an IT and a development standpoint. I want to talk about agile actually from a fulfillment and a physical products distribution standpoint. And uh, one of the, uh, the single biggest changes that we've really seen in the retail sector is uh, the introduction and the establishment of really complex algorithms, more complex algorithms, um, to really decide where products are coming from and where they're ultimately going to. Historically, in retail, um, what you would basically have is products simply being shipped from a distribution center to some sort of a store or some destination. And wherever it was is where it last typically has to get sold from. And uh, usually, if it doesn't get sold, then you go through a markdown strategy to dispose of that item in whatever way that you can. But um, one of the, the biggest differences that we've seen is really this change in, in how products ultimately, where products are coming from and where they go to. So it's no longer store, you know, products coming from a distribution center, but rather products having the capability of coming from stores or even more importantly, and this is something that we'll talk about in a little while, is this notion of third-party partners and products coming directly from manufacturers or even other stores. And that's really the introduction and the creation of the marketplace model, which is probably one of the single biggest changes um, in retail that we've seen in, uh, in the last few years. And then that fulfillment destination, not just being a store or a home, but the fulfillment destination potentially even being other stores or distribution centers themselves. And I'll walk through a couple of those examples. Um, one of the, uh, the single uh, biggest areas of investment that we see a lot of companies in e-commerce and retail really executing is um is supporting uh, in-store pickup, for instance. And uh, in, in, in different markets, we call it different things, click and collect, or you know, kind of that clicks and, and, and bricks um, analogy. Um, but really, the, the idea is to order from the web channel and complete the transaction in the physical store. There are retailers in the United States, department stores like Macy's, and drug stores and convenience stores like Walgreens that essentially offer that. That's just a, a screenshot of behind the counter, some of the, 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 the places where those web pickup orders, which are actually picked from shelf or ultimately um, you, they're laid out for the consumer to come and, and get them. Um, one of the things that I had mentioned on one of the earlier slides is the ability to pick up from not just a store um, or to get items shipped, but also to even pick up from, from a warehouse. And uh, Best Buy is a retailer in the U.S. that sells primarily consumer electronics. And one of the things that I thought was very interesting is that they actually offer the ability to pick up from their warehouse. So one of the challenges in e-commerce, and one of the reasons that it's really been a struggle for a lot of retailers is those fulfillment costs. It's ultimately that last mile of how do you how do you make that cost effective? So what these guys did, I thought was very, very interesting, is that they allowed the opportunity to eliminate that process entirely. And if there is a particular product, because they happen to sell some sometimes very large durable goods like appliances, um, you actually have the ability to pick that up directly from the warehouse itself uh, if, uh, if, if that product is there. So it's not only convenient and there, um, you don't have to worry about scheduling conflicts, but there's a cost savings as well. Um, the other aspect of pickup that we're seeing um, increasingly common, and this is something uh, that in markets like, for instance, in Germany, they've become much, much more common with, uh, with some of the um, developments like DHL pack stations and whatnot, but the flexibility in pickup points. So it's not just the notion of shipping items that are available for, for e-commerce through to a home or even to an office, but actually to ship them to other commercial addresses. Just a couple of examples. In markets like Los Angeles, Walmart actually allows consumers the opportunity to get items shipped to um, other FedEx office locations. And FedEx office is basically, um, they're retail locations where you can go and kind of mail or pick up uh, your your. FedEx um, packages, and they also have the capability of picking up and uh, 
housing those e-commerce orders in particular for, uh, for retailers like this. Um, there is another company in the U.S. called ShopRunner, which used to be part of GSI Commerce, if anyone is familiar with the, the e-commerce landscape in the U.S. Um, but what they offer is the opportunity for some retailers to actually have pickup points in places like 7-Eleven stores. That's actually very common in markets like, uh, like Japan, where a significant part of the e-commerce destination, the pickup points, really are the these, these retail fulfillment spaces. The benefit is not just the convenience aspect that you don't have to be home to receive a package, or you don't have to actually sign for a package, but sometimes there's a cost savings as well. Typically, the carriers, whether it is um, a postal service or a larger third-party carrier like a DHL or a FedEx, I know there are regional carriers in different parts of the world as well, um, but typically the shipment to those commercial addresses is a little bit cheaper than typically shipping to a residential address, often because the addresses are better marked. Theoretically, they're, they're faster to get to. Um, other examples, I'd mentioned the Walmart to FedEx office uh, relationship. This is another interesting example that I, I've seen in the UK that I think is also worth note and potentially something that is, uh, is worthwhile to consider. Uh, John Lewis is a department store in the UK, and when you order from johnlewis.com, you actually have the ability to, lo to, to get your order sent to Waitrose grocery stores. And the reason that this is important is that John Lewis has about probably 60 different venues throughout the UK, but there are about two or three hundred waitress stores throughout the UK. So the latter, the grocery store, is much more penetrated, easier get to get to um, within some sort of a closer driving distance um, to the consumer than most of the John Lewis stores. So the advantage there is that you can take one less populated and less frequent destination and have the product shipped to another destination. This was just the, uh, the DHL pack station that I'd referred to that is pretty popular in, in Germany. In fact, about 20% our estimates are of all e-commerce actually gets picked up at a pack station. So rather than shipping orders to people's homes, what you have is consumers actually getting products sent to these boxes and they get texted um, a code that they then have to enter into this machine and then that opens the door for their, their package to come out. Um, that's essentially the same thing that Amazon is investing in with their lockers, that they're um, locating in different, uh, different retail venues. There are other retail partners. There are stores in the U.S. like Staples and Radio Shack. Um, and even 7-Eleven where Amazon is investing in essentially the same idea as the DHL pack station. Um, you've probably seen several of, of these examples that are essentially drive-through capabilities of a consumer to order online and then pick up products in a physical store by, you know, they get a text message saying that the item is available for pickup and uh, somebody comes out in a, in a, in a little trolley and, and loads stuff into your car. Um, I also find that... Um, the notion at the bottom, which is site to store to door, fulfilling from stores is, is something that retailers are also investing in. Um, there are some retailers, uh, actually in markets in, uh, in Europe in particular, where the, uh, the, just because of the, the density of the population, they've had more of this multi-channel fulfillment. Um, but the idea of fulfilling web orders, not just from distribution centers, but actually from stores, uh, can be incredibly powerful because you have the ability to turn the inventory in those stores much, much more quickly. And uh, you can take advantage of, for instance, aged inventory, which often lies fallow in a store and it really, really hurts that balance sheet. You have the ability to turn that. And the shoe stores in, uh, in the US, uh, Finish Line is an athletic goods retailer. Aldo is actually a women's kind of dress shoe maker. Um, they really have taken advantage of this idea of not just shipping from a distribution center, really just using the distribution center for the long tail and those products that are less likely to be in the physical store, but to use the store wherever there's trapped inventory. So there's almost, there's an algorithm that basically says, you know, kind of this is the item that needs to be shipped. Is there a store within a 
geographic vicinity of the shipping destination that actually has this item that may have a certain level of aging to that inventory where the margin may be uh, prime for a markdown. Let's ship from that store first. And if there isn't such a store where that product is available, then send the order to the distribution center. Um, from, a, from when I think about, you know, kind of agile delivery, this is one of my favorite examples in, uh, in retail recently, is uh, it's a grocery delivery service in the, UK, in, uh, in, in the U.S., actually. It's in the state of Virginia. And it's a company called Relay Foods. And one of the things that they do is that they aggregate different local vendors. So what they'll do is that they will do essentially your grocery shopping for you, um, but they'll do it in, in different places because you don't just go to your grocery store to get your food, you also will want to go to perhaps a local baker or a local butcher or um, some type of a farmer's market to gather different parts of what we call your, your shopping basket. And uh, rather than deal with sending this product to somebody's home, which is one of the most expensive parts of any type of an online grocery delivery business, what they do is that they basically bring it in a truck and park a truck in a parking lot that's often a very populated parking lot. Like for instance, um, this happens to be in the state of Virginia where churches on Sunday are very, very popular. So what they'll do is they'll actually park the truck on a Sunday in a parking lot, in a church parking lot, and let people come um, to that parking lot to pick up their order. So they have the consumer coming to them versus they engage in the very, very expensive process of driving the truck to probably you know, dozens of different neighborhoods to, to ultimately deliver. Um, everywhere access is my point about mobile, which is incredibly important as we, as we all know. Um, but I wanna talk about mobile with respect to the retail component. This is just some high level data. Um, I think that we heard it from, from Vint this morning, which is that um, about half of, of most developed countries uh, now have consumer, well, I should say half of the population within most developed markets now have smartphones um, in their po amongst their population. And the other piece of uh, the mobile component that's critical is the tablet access as well. About Probably about a third of consumers in most developed markets um, own tablets as well and are accessing uh, a lot of E internet content and you know obviously retail content, e-commerce content through these devices. This is uh, some high-level data that Adobe had shared with me a while ago, and uh, this is uh, from a year-over-year -year look from February to February 2012 to 2013, and it's basically the percent of traffic that retail sites. So this is a composite of about 500 retail sites, um, several billion sessions that have been aggregated together. Back in 2012, about 10 percent of traffic was coming through phones and tablets. One year later, more than 20% of that traffic is coming through phones and tablets. So huge, huge uh, double and triple digit growth. Now, the challenge is that what we're seeing is the level of engagement from those devices is really shifting. And uh, this is what you would expect to see, which is the page views on those phones is very, very small disproportionately small relative to the page views on the tablet. What, me, what that means is that the, uh, the type of sessions that consumers are having on phones is, uh, is very low touch types of sessions. And it's often looking at a store locator or trying to find a phone number. And what we also see is that conversion rates on the phones from a commerce standpoint are very, very low. And our definition of a conversion rate is the number of orders divided by the total number of sessions. So the average conversion rate for an e e-commerce site in, on average in general is about two to three percent. So what we see is that for both phones and tablets that number is not only lower, but in the case of phones that number is significantly lower. I mean we're seeing you know kind of anywhere from 20, you know, 10 to 25 percent of the conversion rate on your desktop site is reflected on a phone site. And that's why this is uh, some of the mobile commerce numbers here. This is in this is kind of some U.S. data on uh, total retail in the U.S. is about three trillion dollars. About 10 percent of that, actually less than 10 percent of that is e-commerce, which is the second. Um, it's the light blue. And then you have a really, really teeny tiny number at the very, very bottom, which is m-commerce. So m-commerce, um, which is the volume of transactions of physical goods that are completed on smartphones, um, is very small. Uh, growing, growing quickly, but still small. 
And uh, a large part of the reason why the number of transactions are as small as they are is you know, largely related to the form factor of the phone. Um, but when we look at what are consumers doing on these devices, there's just a lot more uh, research, there's reading of emails. Um, but but, but uh, this, the, the big thing is really the, the level of the store support and uh, the offline kind of on the go level of activity, which the phone really, really supports versus the tablet, which is often, you know, you've heard the expression couch commerce and, and that multi-screen behavior that you see with the tablet. The single most common place where the tablet is actually used for most consumers is next to a television. It's, it's in conjunction with another screen, often in a consumer's living room. Uh, so that creates a very, very different experience. And it also is a reason why there's a lot greater tolerance for lower speeds on tablets because uh, consumers are actually you know, somewhat distracted in what they do. Now, when we look at what are some of the success factors with respect to to M-commerce, there aren't a lot of them. Um, when we look at you know kind of the twelve billion dollars or so that was transacted on phones um, in the last year, a significant part of it was actually Amazon and eBay. <coughs> and uh, when we look at some of the other success cases, they're often flash sale sites. They're time based. Um, you want, you know, you, you need something right away or, you know, kind of the, the capability to purchase it is very fixed based on the number of units that are available. There are a few other examples. I think that digital wallet solutions are still a little early. There are only a couple of examples of even any inkling of success or promise there. There, are, Starbucks has a mobile uh, wallet application, which is, which is fairly successful. At this point, about 10% of the transactions in U.S. Starbucks um, stores are actually through that mobile mobile wallet. Um, but it's still very, very nascent in early days. Um, Apple has an interesting mobile POS solution where essentially it's tied to the iTunes account and you can purchase without having to ever actually talk to a sales associate and complete a transaction there. But these are still extremely rudimentary and uh, early days, I don't really see mobile wallets, um, you know, kind of taking off in a big way um, anywhere really in the world, probably for the next five years. And uh, this is just at the highest level, some of the spend that we see, we see retailers making. Um, this is a framework that, uh, that some of my mobile colleagues have created kind of with respect to how mobile apps and services have evolved over time. And at the highest level, what we're talking about is mobile unique and advanced contextual capabilities. Um, unfortunately, most companies are just simply synchronizing their channels and they basically have some type of a responsive design site where the content on the desktop just renders um, you know, effectively. And most companies, most retail companies, are in fact investing in the low six digits uh, with respect to that mobile strategy. And uh, what I, I want to say, because this is often a big question that we get, is you know, what is the right level of mobile investment? And uh, many of those success cases that I actually pointed out on that previous slide, the companies that are actually seeing a significant portion of their e-commerce coming through mobile commerce, like an eBay or an Amazon or a guilt group, the, uh, the level of investment that those companies are making with mobile unique solutions is actually north of $5 million. And that's, that's a, um, you know, the conundrum fundamentally for a lot of retailers. They don't even have that much money to, uh, to dedicate to some type of a mobile unique solution. And when you don't have that kind of money to dedicate, your next best option is to really just go down to a responsive design site because it's, you know, it's kind of an expression, you go big or you go home. Like why, why bother if you don't you know, necessarily have a, a great plan? Um, when we think about, well, what are those mo mobile unique and those advanced contextual capabilities, um, it really is taking advantage of, of one of these technologies, which is truly, truly unique to these devices that's on the left-hand side of, uh, of, the, of the screen here. And really thinking about, you know, kind of is at least one of them a capability that our, uh, our app or, or, you know, kind of our, our mobile unique site can really take advantage of. Um, now I want to give you a few examples of of uh, some, some ways that some companies have taken advantage of, uh, of mobile unique capabilities. Um, it can be with respect to things as basic as on-the-go scheduling. Um, retailers, like for instance, the carrier networks, for instance, or um, it, it's not even, even it's outside of, 
of commerce-related transaction. Th this is actually an urgent care clinic in the U.S. that uh, enables consumers to, when they're on the go, see how long of a wait time it is at a given you know, ER room before they actually get there. Uh, there's an insurance company in the U.S. called State Farm that has an app with an accelerometer um, that essentially lets um, you know, kind of you sense if you're moving or driving and uh, what you have the capability. It it's, an, it's an app that actually turns off your capability to text while you're driving. Um, so it's, uh, this was actually something that was built for State Farm clients that had teenagers um, to really just kind of make sure that the teenagers weren't texting and driving. Um, the Nearby is a, an app that enables um, retailers, local boutiques, to simply actually just take photographs of inventory that's in their store. So, you know, you have national chains like a Zara or an H&M that are going to have, you know, kind of an inventory management system. But for a lot of local boutiques, they're not going to have these capabilities. So what this type of an app does is basically let store associates take photographs with an iPhone and just upload it to this app that other consumers can download to see um, the inventory that's in a local boutique at a, at, a, at a moment in time so that, you know, if they are interested in something that uh, ultimately drives potentially a store visit. One of the single biggest use cases in retail for the mobile device is price checking. And uh, there are crowdsourced applications like this. This is a, uh, an app called GoodRx. And uh, one of the things in the US is that pharmacy price prescriptions for drugs um, that are prescription drugs often vary wildly from store to store. But this stuff isn't exposed to anyone. The only way that you actually find out is you have to go to a store and say that this is my prescription, how much is it gonna cost me? So what these guys are doing is that they're actually crowdsourcing this information, getting this information from consumers who are going to these different stores, fulfilling these different prescriptions and asking them to upload that pricing data um, so that consumers, if they are in a vicinity and they, they do have a prescription to fill, you can actually see who's likely to have the cheapest price. Um, there's a lot of monitoring in stores through mobile devices. Uh, one of the most interesting examples was a pilot that I think it was Infosys actually built in a convenience store in Romania to sense how many people were walking by an end cap. Um, this is a big deal because end caps are promotional dollars which are paid for by consumer packaged goods companies. They, they pay a lot of money to have placement um, in a place that you know, is in the store that consumers are more likely to walk by. But there's not a lot of data other than the sales data at the POS register. So to actually be able to capture one step higher, which is how many people have walked by that end cap, uh, can actually be more powerful information than some of that POS data that, uh, that ultimately is about conversion data and could be confounded by the product itself not being as compelling as you know, the situation and where it's located in the physical store. Um, this was the, uh, the Easy Pay app that I had referred to. Um, this, I think, is also a really interesting innovation from a company called ZipWhip. It is a startup in Seattle, and what they do is they allow um, stores or destinations that don't necessarily have texting capability to basically send text messages back to consumers um, through, a, uh, through, through a desktop application. So, for instance, if you're a store and you want to confirm that somebody is coming in, to your store for some type of a scheduled appointment. Uh, in the current scenario, you usually have to make a phone call and usually deal with a very cumbersome IVR queue. And what these guys do is essentially allow a consumer to text to a store, and that store actually has the ability to text back through a desktop application. Um, there's a lot of innovation that's actually happening in retail and e-commerce as well. I won't read through every single thing on this slide, but one of the hottest things that we see in the U.S. is uh, innovation labs. And virtually every major retailer has these innovation labs that are ways to really attract te technology and development talent. They're almost always um, not in the headquarters or they're you know miles away. Sometimes they're as far away as Silicon Valley. Um, but the idea is to really attract better talent and uh, to, to get 
um, and seed new, new companies and new businesses. Um, we also see innovation in, in retail in, in a lot of different settings. Um, one of the most interesting ones that, uh, that I think is, is worth note is remote customer service and the ability to aggregate in a different location uh, people who are, for instance, uh, customer service agents to support consumers in a particular, um, in a particular setting. Um, we also have the ability to, uh, to do things like manage retail compliance or, or product development, crowdsourcing ideas through the web and getting a sense of you know, what's the right price to launch a product with based on some internet data. Um, retail compliance, you know, kind of if, if you're a manufacturer, for instance, you don't actually know if a fixture was set up in a store unless you actually send somebody to that store. Uh, but there are now apps like Field Agent or um, Go Spot Check that allow shoppers to basically go to the task of, of going to see if, you know, kind of store compliance was there. Um, just uh, some, some, some other kind of high level examples. Um, is that you know our examples in in e-commerce that are related to you know kind of crowdsourcing product like Corky basically gathers votes from consumers of what are some interesting uh, technology products that consumers want, and it actually creates the ones and manufactures the ones at scale uh, that, cons that that get the most votes. Uh, Shapeways is a company that does 3D printing on demand, so you can actually upload your own design for a product that may have a plastic base or a metal base. And, uh, and you can actually create that, that product and sell it to others if you choose. Um, so these are, are just a, a variety of, uh, of some of those, those innovative examples that, uh, that, that we often see um, you know, that, that are really, really driving and shaping some of the ways that, uh, that, that even larger companies are thinking about their, their e-commerce and selling experience. Um, my O is orthodoxy abandonment. And when I think about you know kind of what's an orthodoxy and orthodoxy is something that is often held very sacred in any given industry. And uh, one of the orthodoxies that is there in retail is that retailers need to buy inventory and sell that inventory. And that's how they make money, is that you have to invest in your inventory and you make money when consumers come to your stores and you purchase it. And uh, the, the person that I think has probably been most successful at abandoning that particular orthodoxy in the last decade is this man. It's Jeff Bezos, of course. And do you like my chess analogy? It kind of brings it back together with my, my earlier point. Um, now, often it's, uh, it's often held that, you know, kind of Amazon is, is just the Walmart of the web. And, and I think that that would be a massive, massive understatement to just call it the Walmart of the web because it is much, much bigger than that. It is, in fact, probably the single biggest transformative influence in retail since Amazon. It is probably the new Amazon, or it is the new Walmart. And um, this, is, this is just a, a lot of data here. I'm not going to go through every single thing on the slide. But the takeaway is that one of the reasons that Amazon is winning is that they have cheaper prices than anybody else. And that's what that data says, is that it is cheaper than just about every other competitor that it could be held competitive to. There are a couple of retailers that it's not cheaper than, like Dollar General and Costco. Those are very, very unique and separate channels. But it is cheaper than everyone. And, 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 and that's, that's an extraordinary thing. Nobody thought that anybody would be able to beat Walmart on price. But that's what this slide shows you, is that Amazon is beating even Walmart on price. And this is the reason that, this is one of the ways, I should say. It's not one of the reasons. I'm going to get to the reasons that it does. But this is one of the ways that it beats Walmart on price, is that it has a dynamic pricing algorithm, where it spiders the web, and it looks for where is the cheapest price. And when it needs to, Amazon will drop the price of a particular item item in order to win the consumer's buy basket. And, uh, and, and that, that's essentially what this data is. It was a, a graphic in the Wall Street Journal um, earlier this year. And it shows a comparison of each of these concentric kind of half circles is a different retailer. There's Amazon, Best Buy, and Sears. And it's looking at the price of that one item. It's a microwave oven in the middle across a 24-hour period of time. In that one 24-hour period of time, Amazon changed its price on that one microwave oven nine times. 
Best Buy changed its price twice. Sears did not pr change its price at all. So the fact that it has that capability of having such fluctuation in its pricing is incredible. And it's an incredible advantage to, to how it's able to do it. Now, part of the reason is that it has a flywheel. Amazon's philosophy, it's said that Jeff Bezos drew, drew this on a napkin at one point, and it adorns the wall of every Amazon employee. It's called their flywheel, and it's why the marketplace, its third-party seller business is so critical. And uh, it's the sellers drive selection, selection drives the customer experience, the customer experience drives traffic, and notice there is no mention of profit in this framework. Now, what is the third-party seller? So in the red box is your typical, this is your typical Amazon product detail page. In that red box, are the third-party sellers. Those are other companies that are selling the same product that Amazon is selling that you have the ability to buy from. And the reason why that red box is really important is because about 40% of the units that are purchased on Amazon are through that third-party marketplace seller. The economics of that are the most important part, which is that Amazon makes on average anywhere from 10 to 15% of the cost of that transaction it makes as revenue. And it has no costs associated with those products. So even though you know, they only make 10 to 15%, there are, no, there are no inventory costs associated with it. Now remember what I said earlier, which is the single biggest orthodoxy in retail is that this belief that you had to buy inventory. These guys are making a huge percent of their profit not owning any inventory. In fact, it's nearly five times their profit, more than five times their profit that they are making in these marketplace co marketplace revenue dollars. And that's what this, this data is, which is that, that basically Amazon is making about $4 billion back in 2011. It made $4 billion by my estimates in its marketplace revenue. Its publicly reported profit was $600 million. So that delta between the light blue and the dark blue are all of those cheaper prices that you see. That's how they're able to afford the cheaper prices, is that they basically have their marketplace sellers helping to subsidize everything from free shipping to Amazon Prime to those lower prices that are able to beat and compete with um, Walmart. And uh, Amazon, by the way, does not have a huge net income as a percent of revenue. It's got a lower profit level than any other company it can be held comparable to, especially the technology companies. Um, but that marketplace is a critical part of its success. And that is the reason that every other company, and these are just some of the American players like Walmart, Barnes & Noble, there are, you know, FNAC has, a, has, a, has their own market, like actually a very successful marketplace. There are companies like ASOS, Tesco, they're all introducing marketplaces onto their e-commerce websites for exactly the same reason. You have Rakuten, Pixmania, um, you know, Etsy that, uh, that are essentially there. Um, now, my last uh, bit here are what I want to talk about, some of these unique experiences. And uh, what, are, what, what, what do we mean by the unique experiences within, within e-commerce? And this is where so much of, uh, of personalization, I think, is critical. And taking advantage of all of the data that we have about a shopper or about a consumer or any type of browser or visitor, and to customize the information and the content that is served to that shopper. So if we were to look back at kind of the, the early days of, of e-commerce sites, um, the, some of the biggest challenges were really that companies were just trying to get their sites up and running. And, uh, and then, you know, kind of post the, the first bubble, we started to see more point solutions being introduced. And you started, you know, once you got past, you know, kind of these, these large deployments, um, you know, where you needed to just have a basic website up that, that you know, kind of could manage through low bandwidth, um, you know, kind of uh, access, you had some site improvements. And, uh, you know, you, you, you had uh, a lot of these things like, you know, ratings and review solutions, or you started to have um, companies like Scene7, which would optimize imagery, or, you know, you started to have on-site search, search solutions. And uh, all of these were just basically plug-in solutions that, that were essentially the, the, the beginning days of, of cloud-based, um, you know, kind of these point solutions. But really, I think that where we are now is in, in, in phase three, and that is 
the opportunity to take advantage of information in a dynamic way. So taking advantage of all of the broad data points that we have about our shoppers and going beyond simply, you know, kind of a one for all execution where every consumer essentially it gets the same experience on every website to, to an experience where every consumer can get a little bit of a unique experience based on who they are or what they have identified as an area of interest to them. And, uh, and we also see a significant mainstreaming of, of platforms in, in the cloud essentially powering a lot of, uh, of, a lot of e-commerce sites. And, um, and what we, we know is that, that companies um, Retailers in particular have, have a whole list of, of factors that, uh, that they know about consumers. Everything from intent that you can gather from, from you know, a, ser a search engine to what is the current click stream of that particular customer. Um, there are likely interests that you can gather through algorithms like collaborative filtering. Um, you have a sense of whether or not this person is a repeat customer or a first time customer. You have location. Um, and you have a lot of information about your own products as well. Like what do you have on hand? What is the profitability of various products that you have? And, uh, and really what, uh, what, what there is, is, is is this amazing ability to, on any given page, identify a whole bunch of things. This is just uh, an example from a company called Runa that um, you know, kind of shared with me, you know, kind of these are, these are you know, so, so you, you know on any given page, you know, kind of where a consumer could have come from. So in this case, um, they happen to be coming from a Google search for Movado watches. And uh, this was the exact term that they had typed. And they had typed in a certain number of terms before they actually came to the site. You know that geographically they're in a certain place and that they've spent a certain amount of time on the site. Um, and you also see how much time they're spending on any given page. Are they actually reading the pages or are they kind of spear phishing very quickly to go through? Um, you know what specific products and, uh, and you also know if they've, if they've carded something or not. So based on all of that information, um, you know, there's this great ability to then decide, okay, this is a customer that maybe you want to target with a very, very specific offer. Um, because often right now, so much of the marketing and the promotions that are happening are typically that one for all capability to offer. But, you know, kind of if you've identified that this is a person who happens to live in a geography that's very, very affluent and they are obviously coming to the site multiple times and really, really looking closely at this, there is that higher likelihood that this is a person who um, has the propensity to ultimately convert or even at least add an item to cart versus uh, another person. And uh, you know, even that ability of how rich or how deep should that particular offer be to that consumer um, can really vary based on all of these, these insights and these data points that are there. And, uh, and when we look at, you know, kind of I often get asked the question, you know, who really does personalization well? And, um, and uh, you, you know, often I'll you know, point, of course, to companies like Amazon, but I'll also point, of course, to companies like Netflix that, that really have done exactly what we're talking about, which are these, these abilities to take advantage of all of these disparate data points and, and, and fire um, very, very specific uh, offers to them. Um, even at the very basic level, you know, typically what I will recommend is that um, even if you don't have all of those data points and all of that insight that's there, at least to differentiate between new and repeat visitors can be incredibly critical. That's, that's what uh, companies like um, you know, Free People, which is part of Urban Outfitters, which is an apparel retailer in the US, or Neiman Marcus really do. The illustrations there on the top are you know, kind of an offer for a repeat customer, which really wasn't an offer, versus first-time customers um, do get some type of a free shipping code. Um, even taking advantage of other merchandising tactics, like how many items are remaining, or how much time will something remain in your cart, these are all things that, uh, that can be incredibly powerful and impactful in, in ultimately driving conversion. So I'm going to wrap up with uh, with basically my summary of uh, of those uh, of those five vowels here, and uh, and you know if we have maybe a minute or two for for questions, I'm happy to take those at the end. Um, but one is that agility is is more than just kind of technology agility. It also means new approaches to supply chain fulfillment and how you're accessing products that that are physically there. 
Um, my second point is that mobile unique solutions are driving success for many e-commerce teams. Now the challenge with mobile unique is that the cost of entry into mobile unique is very, very high. Um, but if you do have those, the, such a budget and you have the capability and the, uh, the capacity, they can be incredibly rewarding. Um, innovation in products, processes, and hiring has uh, really bolstered the best e-commerce organizations. I really encourage um, innovation labs and, uh, and looking at some of these, these startups that have some interesting success as, uh, as case studies. Um, industry disruptors will absolutely destroy orthodoxies. And I always use Amazon as the example of the company that has destroyed the orthodoxies in retail, and uh, companies with a plan B are the ones that are going to survive. And, uh, and finally, when we talk about the unique experiences, data now enables extraordinary personalization. Um, screens are smaller, attention is fragmented, so the more personalized the experience, the more that you have that ability to, to really retain um, the attention of the shoppers that you have. This um, is my contact information. If you do have any questions or uh, if you don't get a copy of the presentation but you want a copy of the presentation, um, I'm happy to, to email it to anybody. That's my Twitter address as well.